Welcome to the NGOH monthly webinar. My name is Martin Hoek, communication manager for NGOH and your host for today. This meeting will be recorded and made available on our YouTube channel. We have two guests today who will tell us more on their work on highly pathogenic avian influenza. We will start with two presentations followed by a plenary discussion. Please use the chat function for your questions. Our first speaker for today is Professor Thijs Kuiken. Thijs is a veterinarian by training and graduated from the veterinary faculty in Utrecht. After a brief stint in the field in a mixed veterinary practice, he has since dedicated himself fully to research and has won prestigious awards both in the Netherlands and abroad. He is currently working at Erasmus Medical Center in Rotterdam as professor of comparative pathology, focusing on infectious diseases at the interface between humans livestock and wildlife. Professor Thijs Kuiken, welcome and the floor is all yours. Thank you very much Martin. Thank you for inviting me to give this presentation and I see this presentation as a, as a platform for um, the next presentation by uh, doc, Dr. Van Tour on, on uh, the, the linkage between ornithology and virology. In this presentation, I'm going to talk about uh, the spread of H5N1 avian influenza from Europe to North America. And before I start, I'd like to acknowledge the many people who have been involved in this research, um, many different uh, co-authors and particularly uh, Valentina Caliendo, my PhD student, Nicola Lewis from the Royal Veterinary College, Anna Polman from the Friedrich Löffler Institute, and Johannes Berhane from the Canadian Food Inspection Agency. Also many other people are involved. I also like to acknowledge the um, laboratories that originated and submitted the sequences of influenza virus in the GISAID database and different um, funding organizations, European organizations, uh, funding projects Delta Flu and uh, VEO, as well as separate um, national um, funding organizations in the different countries in Europe and in North America. So just before Christmas, we were shocked by a report that highly pathogenic avian influenza H5N1 had been diagnosed in Newfoundland in Canada. And here you can see where Newfoundland is in respect to North America and um, Europe. So this is a small step for uh, H5N1 virus, but a big headache for society. The actual index case was an exhibition farm of uh, over 400 species, 400 birds of different species shown here. Um, on the farm, there was also a, a pond where um, wild and domestic birds mixed. The farmer first noted mortality of birds on the 9th of December, and one week later, by the 16th of December, 306 birds had died. And the um, Canadian Food Inspections Agency came to collect samples for virological analysis, and um, four days later, the diagnosis of high-path avian influenza virus H5N1 of the Goose Guangdong lineage was confirmed. And retrospectively, they found um, a, a wild bird, a great black-backed gull, had been found ill nearby on the 26th of November, died the next day, and um, um, it also was diagnosed with the same virus. Here you can see the, the city of St. John's. Um, here's the international airport, and here is the location of the farm within the city limits. So I'm going to give this talk on the basis of the following questions what is actually highly pathogenic avian influenza, what causes it to emerge, what do wild birds have to do with it, what is this goose guangdong lineage, how did this virus get to St. John's, what's going to happen next in North America, and what's One Health got to do with it. So just some basics, um, highly pathogenic avian influenza virus is a, um, an influenza A virus, it has an envelope, as you can see here in this electron microscope, photograph and on the envelope there are two surface proteins which give the these viruses their um, names. One is the hemagglutinin 
and the other is the neuraminidase. And according to these two surface proteins and their categorizations, um, there are um, uh, uh, the, the virus is given its, its name, for example, in this case, H5N1. And there are 16 different hemagglutinin subtypes in birds and nine different neuraminidase subtypes in birds. And one special um, characteristic of influenza A viruses is that besides being able to mutate quite rapidly, they are also able to reassort. And this is because the um, genome of the virus is made up of eight different segments. And when two different influenza viruses, a blue one and a red one, infect the same host cell, these different gene segments can get uh, mixed up, and um, the progeny virus particles um, can have some gene segments from one virus, let's say the blue virus, and other gene segments from the other virus, let's say the red virus. And this means that they can very rapidly um, generate influenza variants that have properties from different parent viruses. And for example, this can happen between uh, influenza viruses from birds, influenza viruses from pigs, and influenza viruses from people. Also important to know is that there are two categories of avian influenza virus. In nature, um, by far the most um, common category is low pathogenic avian influenza virus, which causes no or very little disease in chickens. And in fact, um, wild birds that carry influenza virus nearly always only have low pathogenic avian influenza virus. However, if this low pathogenic avian influenza virus gets onto a poultry farm with many chickens close together, a mutation is possible in the hemagglutinin, which allows the virus to replicate throughout the body of the chicken and thereby become more pathogenic, causing more severe disease. And this mutation um, changes it from a low to a highly pathogenic avian influenza virus. And this is the one that we're concerned about in the poultry sector. And these conversions from low to high pathogenic um, nearly always occur on um, intensive poultry farms in a retrospective survey of um, uh, these conversions from low to high path avian influenza, 36 of the 39 conversions um, reported um, had occurred in intensive poultry farms. And um, as the poultry sector is uh, growing around the world, um, there, are also, there are also an associated increase in these um, conversion events from low to, path to high pathogenic avian influenza in poultry. So um, highly pathogenic avian influenza is becoming a bigger and bigger problem as the poultry population worldwide is increasing. So what do wild birds have to do with it? Well, the, the, their um, involvement is as a source of low pathogenic avian influenza virus, but they are not normally the cause of highly pathogenic avian influenza. As I've indicated just now, um, this um, uh, conversion from low to high path occurs nearly always in the commercial poultry farms. Here you can see an overview um, from a review back in 2006, uh, a kind of meta-analysis of um, all studies that had been done on wild birds looking for avian influenza virus. And you can see that there have been many thousands, tens of thousands of birds of different species that have been examined. And um, the most commonly, uh, uh, the, the, the species in which low pathogenic avian influenza virus is found most commonly are different water bird species, mainly ducks, geese, and swans, and also uh, gulls and terns, and some other uh, water associated bird species also are found with avian influenza virus. And nearly only this is a low pathogenic avian influenza virus. So what is this uh, so-called goose Guangdong lineage? 
So this uh, lineage is, um, uh, has its origin, um, as far as we can tell, in 1996 in the province of Guangdong in China, when on a commercial goose farm, um, there was an outbreak of high pathogenic avian influenza caused by an H5N1 virus. And this virus was named um, A Goose Guangdong 196. And this virus um, has evolved um, over the last uh, um, 25 years or more, and is still um, circulating around the world. In the first years after it emerged, until 2005, um, it spread locally, regionally within Asia. And here you can see the avian influenza virus situation in 2004. But around that time, um, this uh, Goose Guangdong lineage of H5N1 spilled over into wild birds at the wild, poultry wild bird interface, probably um, in a situation as shown here, where um, domestic ducks are allowed to go onto rice fields to graze, where they also mix with uh, wild ducks and other wild water birds. And in this way, the virus um, spilled over into the wild bird populations. And from there, it was able to spread further across Eurasia. And this is how it spread long distance. Um, here is an example that um, first in, uh, uh, Southeast Asia. Um, in the winter, there is the virus in the wintering birds. The birds um, during spring migration take the virus with them to the breeding areas in the north of the Eurasian continent in Siberia, um, on, the, on the north coast of Russia. And then um, in the following autumn, um, the birds are able to take virus with them towards um, wintering areas, both back in uh, uh, Southeast Asia, but also in Europe. And um, one time it has also occurred that they've brought it back to the wintering area in North America. So in this way, the virus is able to spread long distance with wild bird populations. And after 2005, um, the Goose Guangdong lineage of H5 and X, and it's called the NX now because it, it often uh, reassorts with uh, low pathogenic avian influenza viruses present in wild birds. After 2005, this virus was found not only in Asia, but much further afield in the Middle East, in Europe, and also in Africa. And since then, it has only expanded its range. The virus um, had its first large outbreak in 2005-2006. Then a, there was a space of nine years when there were no major outbreaks, but since then nearly every year it has caused outbreaks um, in um, uh, Europe and Africa and twice also in North America. The first time in 2014 to 2015, as I showed you, the virus got there via the Bering Strait. And the second time, um, what I've just mentioned, the, the occurrence in Newfoundland, and there is a question mark how the virus got there. So in December, 2021, the virus was detected here in St. John's, Newfoundland. At the time, there was a big outbreak of H5N1, Goose Guangdong lineage occurring in Europe. So how did the virus get from here to there? So to investigate this, um, we formed a consortium of uh, North American and, and European uh, partners and uh, looked firstly at the um, phylogenetic analysis of H5N1 viruses. Here in red are the viruses from Newfoundland in the, um, on the exhibition farm, shown here, all these chicken um, isolates, and here from the great black-backed gull in Newfoundland also. And the closest relationship was found with European strains from 2021, different species that were found um, from uh, spring to summer of 2021, showing that um, most likely this virus um, came from Europe. And again, by uh, phylogenetic analysis, it was possible to find out what the dates were for the most recent common ancestors 
of the different gene segments of this uh, Newfoundland virus. And the um, dates range from December 2019 to April 2021, indicating that um, around about the spring of 2021, but not later than that, um, there's a, a common ancestor of this Newfoundland virus with the viruses from Europe. So with this knowledge, it was interesting to go back to the um, outbreak in uh, Europe in 2021, 2022, and see what we can find out from that. And here you can see the um, uh, outbreak in Europe, all European countries, except, uh, so all EU countries um, are, are, are combined here. And in the top graph, you can see the number of high path avian influenza virus detections in poultry. And in the bottom graph, you can see the number of high path avian influenza virus detections in wild birds from the 1st of October, 2020 until um, the um, December, 2021. And an unusual aspect of this outbreak is that there was a major peak of um, occurrence of the virus in the spring, in March, April of 2021, which is very unusual. We haven't seen that before. And as an example to show that we haven't seen it before, I compare the um, geographical distribution of high path avian influenza virus detections in Europe in the previous big outbreak in 2016-2017. So here you can see in May 2017 that the virus had nearly disappeared. It had caused most problems before that time and by spring it had gone. In contrast, in May 2021, the virus was still present in uh, Europe, mostly in wild birds and in a few cases also in uh, domestic birds. And this indicated that the virus was persisting in resident wild birds in Europe during 2021. This is something new. What else was new is that um, there were three various different species that uh, were uh, in which the virus was, was found more often. Um, a major species in which it caused a lot of mortality was the barnacle goose, again in 2020, 2021 for the first time. And here you can see the, the breeding ranges and the wintering ranges of uh, barnacle geese. So um, the ones that um, winter along the coast of the Netherlands and Germany um, uh, breed uh, a, a lot in Siberia, but there's another population um, on the, that, that winters on the west coast in the Solway Firth in uh, the UK that uh, um, breeds in Svalbard. And there's another uh, connected popula wintering population in uh, Scotland and Ireland that breeds in Greenland. Similarly, for the first time, we saw high mortality in another species, the red knot, shown here with neurologic signs. And this red knot um, has populations that, while they winter in uh, Europe, they breed either uh, here, again in Siberia, or here in uh, uh, green, Greenland or the um, high Canadian Arctic. And then another species in which the virus was found was in the Great Skua, um, both um, on uh, the Shetlands and here on a small island off the Outer Hebrides. And here you can see the, the wide range that the Great Skua has right across um, the North Atlantic to Greenland and to Canada and Northern United States. And um, bring together the information from virology and from uh, ornithology with uh, um, expert ornithologists from both Europe and North America taking part, we found basically three major possibilities for the transmission of the virus between Europe and Newfoundland. One involved um, either uh, um, waterfowl or shorebirds um, that might be breeding on Iceland. So in spring migration, they, they go from Europe to Iceland and maybe further afield to uh, uh, Greenland and to the um, uh, high Canadian Arctic. And afterwards, um, either these species or other species during the fall migration go down towards 
um, the, the uh, uh, coast of, of Canada, including uh, St. John's. So that's one possibility. Um, and the other possibility is that um, the, the uh, um, virus spread by pelagic seabirds um, in the spring of uh, 2021, going from uh, Europe to um, uh, areas over the mid-Atlantic ridge, where millions of these pelagic seabirds congregate, and then in uh, the fall, um, going from there to the coast of Canada, including St. John's. So these are different putative routes that um, the virus may have um, gone from Europe to North America. And it's very difficult to say um, on the basis of the information we have, which specific bird species um, actually carry the virus across. So what's next in uh, North America? So here you can see again um, um, the, the uh, occurrence of uh, H5N1 on Newfoundland, both in wild birds, WB, and in poultry. And since then, um, the virus has been detected more often. So this map of North America shows you in the green dots, the occurrences of um, the H5N1 virus, the detections in, of the H5N1 virus in different provinces of Canada and the states of the United States until this morning. Um, it also shows you the different flyways that water birds use across North America. First, the um, Atlantic America's flyway on the East Coast, then the um, Mississippi flyway in the middle of the continent on the East side, then the um, Central flyway again th through the middle of the continent, but further West. And finally, the um, Pacific America's flyway on the Pacific coast of North America. Until now, um, there have been several uh, detections of the virus in, uh, since Newfoundland, first in Nova Scotia in poultry, and then in nearly, no, in all the states of the United States, um, from uh, Maine down to Florida in wild birds and occasionally also in poultry. So these are all in the Atlantic flyway. And then um, bordering between the Atlantic flyway and the Mississippi flyway, you can see that there have been two detections of the virus in poultry in Kentucky and in Indiana, indicating that the virus is spreading um, further uh, west across the continent. And the um, concern is, is that um, since this virus has already adapted well to wild bird populations, it will spread further um, across um, the North American continent, going to the Mississippi, the Central, and perhaps also the Pacific flyways. And we have an example of another emerging virus that has done that, West Nile virus, that first emerged in New York and within a few years had reached the uh, West Coast of North America. You can see here that uh, um, in total, um, there have been uh, 247 um, different detections of the virus in wild birds in the USA. Mostly these are hunter harvested birds. And this is probably reflected by the different species that you can see here. Um, in a few cases, it's also been um, uh, trap and release birds. And uh, in one case, a snow goose, it was a, in a bird found ill. So the conclusions regarding this uh, um, Goose Guangdong lineage of uh, H5 high path avian influenza virus is that it's spilled over into wild birds around 2005 and in the last year um, apparently has become able to persist in wild bird populations year round. Outbreaks are increasingly, increasingly becoming more frequent. Um, the virus is continuing in its expansion both in geographical range and host range, um, now spreading in North America from the East Coast for the first time ever. Um, this lineage of virus may be a significant mortality factor in some wild bird populations. So not only a problem for poultry, but also for wild birds. And besides, there's also a zoonotic um, concern 
um, in Europe, there's currently a low to medium risk of transmission to people that are occupationally exposed to infected birds or uh, infected mammals. Recommendations of what we can do um, in wildlife, there's not much we can do. We've, we've uh, allowed this virus to escape from poultry into wild bird populations. What we can do is avoid activities that disturb affected wild birds and so reduce the risk of spread. Um, in certain areas where um, uh, that are regularly used by birds of prey, um, we can collect the infected bird carcasses to avoid uh, further spread of the virus. Also, we can do that in areas where um, there are many birds resting or foraging um, in, in, in the hope of uh, um, reducing the spread. Um, it's important to carry out uh, more intensive passive and active surveillance in wild birds and also in potentially exposed wild mammals and important uh, for the record to um, assess how many wild birds are dying from this virus. In poultry, um, different from current practices, it may be um, expedient in certain areas to vaccinate against the virus. Um, it's certainly important to uh, uh, improve biosecurity measures on poultry farms and on the long term, not so much for this virus variant specifically, but for um, future emergence of high path avian influenza virus, it's important um, to reduce farm size, to reduce farm density, certainly in poultry dense poultry areas and uh, not to have farms in water bird rich areas where the spread of avian influenza virus from wild birds to poultry has the highest risk of occurring. In people, it's important to um, carry out surveillance in people that are potentially exposed to infected animals, either birds or poultry or, or wild birds. Um, it's also uh, may be expedient to carry out seasonal influenza vaccination in people that are professionally exposed to potentially infected animals to avoid the risk of um, reassortment between seasonal influenza virus and this um, Goose Guang Dong lineage of high path avian influenza virus. And for all these areas, it's important that we uh, have a timely generation and sharing of virus genome sequences to be able to follow the, the course of the outbreaks. So what's One Health got to do with it? Well, I, I don't think I need to mention that uh, this, this uh, disease outbreak involves uh, wild birds, poultry, um, wild mammals also, and people. So One Health is very important. And I finish with a citation from uh, Bibi Koresh in 2003. The health of people, livestock, and wildlife can't be discussed in isolation anymore. There is just One Health. And the solutions require everyone working together on all different levels. Thank you. Very interesting, Thais. Very interesting. Thank you. There are a few questions, but I'm going to ask you to be concise in answering them because we, are, we also want to leave enough time for our second speaker. But first of all, what's up with the ducks? Because I think even if we correct for the sample size, I think the p-value will still show that ducks are significantly more likely to carry low pathogenic avian influenza. Why is that? Um, so I think that uh, uh, dabbling ducks especially are, are, uh, um, have, have co-evolved with the low pathogenic avian influenza virus. Um, uh, this virus uh, is spread from bird to bird, um, primarily through contaminated, fecally contaminated water. Mm. And uh, the way that uh, um, dabbling ducks live um, in groups in which, and, and, and dabbling on the surface of, of uh, uh, still waters, it's a very uh, efficient way for the virus to um, be transmitted from uh, one bird to the other. So that's why they're considered to be important um, uh, reservoir hosts for low pathogenic avian influenza virus. Um, it's not so clear, but it's also so that that um, gulls, for example, uh, black-headed gulls that, that we have studied a lot um, in Europe, 
uh, are uh, important reservoir hosts for particular subtypes of um, low pathogenic avian influenza virus, namely H13 and H16. So there too, um, it's the, the relationship of the birds um, living in an aquatic environment that allows the virus to be maintained um, in these populations. That sounds logical. Thank you for that. Um, then we have, what is the risk? You mentioned that there is sometimes, uh, you know, there's a risk for humans to do vaccination of veterinarians and farms that work on poultry farms. Uh, well, what is the risk to them? How may it spill over into the human population? Can we also get it from uh, infected poultry that get uh, end up on our plate? Um, what, how do you see a potential event unfolding there and how can we prevent it? Okay, um, so people in Europe uh, usually don't get infected with uh, this virus. Um, the main risk of such um, transmission occurring is when um, farms are that on which there is a high path avian influenza virus in poultry are depopulated. So it's in this process of depopulation that um, is, the, is the highest risk of infection. Um, this has happened in the past in the Netherlands in 2003. Um, and uh, uh, last year, it also was, was detected in Russia during depopulation of a farm. Um, in these uh, cases, uh, uh, in, in Russia, where, where it was also this uh, variant of a uh, high path avian influenza virus, um, people did not show any clinical signs, but it does show that, that virus transmission is possible. The concern is um, in the first place that the virus can mutate um, into a, um, a, 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 a variant that is able to be transmitted easily from one human to another. Um, the other concern is that the virus uh, reassorts with um, a human influenza virus that such a person might also be carrying. And that's the, the reason um, to suggest that people involved with poultry and also with wild birds um, become get vaccination against a seasonal influenza virus to to reduce the risk of such a reassortment occurring. Mm. Yes, that makes sense. One more question on vaccination. I believe that the vaccination of poultry farms could be part of the solution, but it results in trade restrictions. Is there any progress on that? Um, I think there's a there's more and more pressure coming in Europe um, to um, speed up the the um, possible. Um, change in the procedures from uh, uh, what we now have as the stamping out policy um, in, in uh, poultry farms where high path avian influenza virus is detected to a vaccination, a preventative vaccination policy. So this is, a, um, um, I think there's a lot of pressure on different um, governments in Europe to do this. And uh, one is the question of the, the, the trade um, uh, restrictions that are currently in place. And the other is the, um, the lack of um, experience with um, preventive vaccination, um, the lack of uh, um, certainty about the um, efficacy um, of, the, of the, the vaccine because it hasn't been used um, uh, in Europe um, yeah. until now. Yeah, very good. There's a few more questions on geographical distribution, but I think before we answer them, we should move on to the second speaker because she has lots to say about that. So for now, uh, Professor Kuyk, I thank you for your uh, presentation and we'll come back to you in the plenary session. So our next speaker of today is Dr. Marielle Van Toor. She studied biological sciences in Germany and after successfully completing her PhD, summa cum laude, uh, titled Hitchhiker Guide, but what about migration? And for those who are uh, into books, she was the 42nd PhD to finish, to graduate from her department. Um, I'm not sure that can be a coincidence. She now self-identifies as a movement ecologist with a soft spot for ducks and bats. And this information you can find on her personal webpage, and I suggest you check it out because there's some very cool information on migration patterns and of various species on it. Marielle's ambition is to understand the movements and movement decisions of individuals through a combination of animal telemetry, 
and remotely sensed environmental information, hoping to increase our understanding of the consequences of animal movement on the environment, such as the dispersal of seeds and pathogens. This sounds highly relevant and I'm super excited. So Marielle, uh, you currently work as a researcher at the Linnaeus University Kalmar in Sweden and the floor is all yours. Thank you, Martin, for the nice introduction. Um, I hope you will all be able to see my presentation now. Um, so as Thais has already um, said, water birds and wild water birds especially are um, probably not the source of avian influenza, but they are, they can be to a degree implicated in the spread of the disease. And as you said, I work at Linnaeus University together with Professor Jonas Weidenström, and together we've been trying to shed some light on how wild bird migration plays a role in the spread of avian influenza virus. So what I'm going to start with is actually not birds, but trying to make a case why looking at the movements of the host might be useful for understanding how a disease might spread. And for that, I would like to take you to a study from 2013. Uh, it's one of my favorite ones by Dirk Brockman and Dirk Helbing, who basically looked at the question whether understanding host mobility can tell you anything about the mobility of the disease. So, and what you see here is an um, example that they used in the study as well from 2009, H1N1 pandemic, which was obviously in humans and so not in birds. And what you see here, is on the x-axis is geographic distance between the location where the disease was first reported, which was in Mexico, and the time that it took to reach other locations. And as you can see, um, geographic distance is not a particularly good predictor of how long it takes for a disease to reach these uh, like other places. And what they thought was maybe we should look at how humans travel nowadays to better understand how this disease travels as well. And what they did was look at um, long distance travel in terms of air passenger traffic. And they looked at basically how long does it take for humans to travel between any two um, airports on the world and um, how much passenger flow there is between two airports. And from this, they derived the metric that they called um, basically effective distance rather than geographic distance. and um, and then basically simulated disease on top of this and how it would spread using an SIR model. And what you can see from this is that this effective distance instead of geographic distance is much better at predicting how long it takes for a disease to spread to any place on the planet. And what this does is actually reduce a very, very complex pattern of spread back to a very simple wave model. Uh, and I hope you find this as compelling as I do. And I think this is a very good reason to at least attempt to understand how wild bird migration might play a role in avian influenza. So let's go back to birds. Um, and obviously, in terms of wild birds, we know a lot less about their long distance migrations than we know about human travel. Um, we do know quite a bit, especially since it has been studied for quite some time already. Um, and this is especially using ring recovery data. This is mostly in, done in bird observatories where people catch birds, wild birds. And then you can look at the species, you can measure the individual, you can age it, you can sex it, you can take samples. But most importantly, each individual gets a uniquely identifiable ring, um, like a little metal ring, uh, a little bit like a bird passport, so to speak. And if this bird gets recaptured in a different observatory, or if it is found dead, also by um, citizens that then reported to their national um, ringing scheme, for example, you get an additional data point about this bird. And this tells you how long did it take to travel there? How far did it travel? Where did it end up and where did it come from? And um, this is the, the oldest type of studying bird migration, which has been around for more than a hundred years. But nowadays we have different methods available and they all differ a little bit in the scope and in the kind of detail that you can get from it. At the very extreme end, I placed radar because actually scientists use um, weather radar data. Um, so basically you use weather radar data to see where there's precipitation 
and they filter out the noise. But part of this noise is actually birds. You can even see insects on there. And with birds, they are large enough that you can see individual individuals, but you can't necessarily pin it down to species. But you, what you get from this is a very live view of where bird migration is occurring at the time. And this provides a very broad geographic scope for seeing bird migration. Um, also very popular and increasing at the moment are citizen science reports, where you have national or international platforms, like for example, eBirds, where everybody can go and report their observations. And this is a very important source of information that we can use for studying also bird migration. Um, and then on the other end, where you get a lot of detail about very few individuals, but then you get, really get a lot of information um, is using remote animal telemetry. And that is the approach that we've been using most up until now. Um, and how this works is we capture individuals, often during the wintering or during the stopover site, where we can use duck traps that are existing already. And then we equip these birds with a little device that is, uh, in our case, a GPS GSM transmitter. And what this stands for is just how this tag communicates. So all of these transmitters, there's different methods available, but the ones that we use are GPS, GSM. So they use the GPS satellites um, to position the tag and thus the individual on the planet. So you get a timestamp and a location. And then the same tag has a different antenna that it uses to communicate with um, cell phone towers and then transmits the data. And from the cell phone towers, it gets uploaded to a database where we can then remotely access the data. As I said, there's different ways of positioning and there's different way of data transmission. There's also some uh, types of tags where you have to recapture the individual to actually extract the information. But in the end, the, the kind of principle remains the same. And the data that you get from this looks a little bit like this. Um, so you have a timestamp and you have an associated location. And from this, if you get a series of these kind of points, you can look at different time scales and you can see the behavior of the individual. You, um, either like where it moves or like you can see uh, large scale movements like migratory movements, or you can also just look a little bit more closely and maybe see how it moves between a pond and a field to go foraging. And these tags also often have additional sensors on board. So often you get accelerometry, like you have in the phone, so you can determine whether an individual is active or not, or temperature readings. Um, and because you have a timestamp and a location, you can also put it in environmental context using, for example, satellite imagery or climate models. So you can basically see the, the conditions that this individual experienced at the time and maybe correlate it to behaviors. And if you have more than one individual in the same area, you might even be able to look at interactions between individuals. And what these data are usually used for is quite a wide range of um, approaches. So you can look at the movement itself, you can look at interactions, but I think from a one health perspective, most interesting could be looking at where individuals die. Where do they come in contact with humans? Where do they come in contact with, for example, pathogens and uh, pollutants? Or in the case of um, avian influenza, why might there be contact zones between um, wild birds and domestic poultry? And where might they then take the disease? So, um, and the data that we have collected so far is from several species and from different locations. Some of these data are our own and some are from collaborators. Uh, there's also a lot more data available to which I don't have access. So um, the map is not quite as empty as it looks here. This is just the one that I have access to. Um, so what you see here is that a lot of ducks are actually quite long distance migrants. And especially I would like to point out the Garganis um, that we caught in Bangladesh who are able to traverse the Himalayan mountains and migrate over five and a half thousand meters altitude to reach their um, breeding grounds. And how do we use this data now to link wild bird migration with the spread of avian influenza virus? And for this, I would like to take you to the site where I'm actually working, which is probably one of the best studied wild duck populations in the world. And that is um, the stopover site at Ottenby. Ottenby is uh, the southern tip of the island of Ireland, which is here in the Baltic Sea. And 
there has been a duct trap for a long time, and since 2002, it has been used to monitor low pathogenic avian influenza virus in mallets that uh, stop here during the autumn in particular. So what happens then is that during autumn migration, the duct trap is open every day, and every day it catches quite a lot of individuals. Um, I think the current record is over 280 individuals in a day. And then all of these individuals get scooped up, boxed up, they get weighed, they get measured, they get ringed. Um, so you get every individual get measured and it gets uh, one of the little rings. And then they also take a fecal sample every day. So you can reconstruct the infection history of the bird. And because this is a stopover site, a lot of individuals actually stay for a little bit of time, maybe two, three weeks. And during this time, they often get recaptured. So you get basically multiple observations from the same individual. And then at the end, the bird is released again. And then probably the next morning, you will find it back in the trap. And when I originally moved to Kalmar, I had the opportunity to actually tag along and um, put GPS, GSM transmitters on a number of birds. So the data that we kind of got during this time was you have high resolution movement data from a few individuals. Um, you have the infection history of the entire population during autumn. From many, many decades, you already have ring recovery data, so you know where the wintering distribution of these birds are. You can look at the individual parameters, such as sex and age or condition, and often you have repeated observations. And what you can derive from this is, for example, a, a movement model. The infection history has been previously used to make disease models and look at infection and recovery but also the, the dynamics in the different um, uh, um, strains of influenza that show up here. As I said, you can look at the wintering distribution, the population structure, but also how long individuals stay and when they leave again. And um, this is the kind of data that you get from this. So for example, in the top left, um, you have the population size at the stop oversight over time. So this is from 2004, for example, where you see the blue line um, shows juveniles. So juveniles contribute most to the population, but also because they're immunologically more naive than adult individuals, they're more likely to get infected. And then on the right hand side, you have the immigration probability, which means it's like how likely are individuals to leave at any given day. Um, and then you have infection probability, which is relatively low throughout the season in this year, and individuals are relatively good at recovering from basically one capture to the next. In the movement terms, you get ring recoveries, as I said. So on the right-hand side, you see the rough wintering distribution of birds trapped at Ottenby. Um, so this is basically from around October to February. This is where the birds are. And then for breeding, they move back into the Baltic states for in Finland, for example. And when we look at the, the movement data, so this is relatively high resolution. So what you can get from that is look at the mathematical properties of the movement process. And in this case, what I used was turning angle, which is basically the directional persistence of the individual during migration. How straight is it flying? But also how fast is it flying? That is expressed in the step length. And what you can do with this kind of model is basically reconstruct um, trajectories that are simulated in, that have the same mathematical properties as to actually observe tracks. So this is an example where I simulated um, alternative migrations for an individual mallet that was caught at Lake Constance in southern Germany. So the blue line shows the actual trajectory of the bird and the green ones are simulations for the same starting and end location from um, a model derived from this individual. So you can see that you can kind of reconstruct the same mathematical properties, but you can get alternative trajectories to basically make an assumption about what the rest of the population might have done. And if you stick all of this together, the movement model, the population model, the disease model, you can look at where do, when do birds migrate from autumn bee? Where do they go? And what is the chance of them being infected at the time that they leave? And what is the probability of them recovering before they actually arrive at the next stopover site? And if you take all of this together, you can look at 
when would you expect um, disease to be dispersed from autumn? And as you can see here, it's a relatively few virus dispersal events that might happen during a season, but that doesn't matter because you have so many birds that it happens anyway, and it's mostly again in juvenile birds, just because these are more susceptible. And then you can look at where do these birds go. And um, here these little hexes basically show the, the, the yellow ones are the most likely locations where you would expect the low pathogenic avian influenza virus to show up after birds transport them away. And the black lines basically show uh, where the birds that we actually tracked ended up for the first stopover location. Um, and with that, I would like to say, you might, you might think malice, that is not particularly impressive. They just fly 300 kilometers across the Baltic Sea and then they stop down again. Um, but mallets are relatively short distance migrants for a dabbling duck. And we have observed several more species, for example, pintails. And I wanted to just briefly show you what they are capable of. Um, this was a pintail, a northern pintail that was tagged by our collaborators in Portugal during winter. And when it decided to start spring migration in March 15, um, within 34 hours, it had traveled more than 2,300 kilometers, mostly because it managed to catch a storm. Um, so it flew at speeds of up to, 100 and one, up to 180 kilometers per hour um, because it had very good tailwinds. Sadly, this individual didn't actually manage to get much further than that because it was taken by a golden eagle relatively close to where I live. Um, but these are kind of movements that you could expect to happen. And just because there's so many million species, so many million individuals of water birds, even if just one single one is infected, it might be enough to transport the disease over quite some distance. Um, this is what I wanted to tell you about today. Uh, at the moment, we're basically trying to expand our our pool of species and going beyond the Baltic Sea and looking at, looking at a more continental approach. We would also like to integrate re more ring recovery and citizen science data to get a more broad overview of how birds move and when they move. So we can also look at the drivers of migration and decision making, because, for example, geese particularly and other avian herbivores like wigeons, um, they, for example, time their spring migration very closely to spring phenology when the grass starts greening up. And the same, something similar might happen in the autumn as well. And it could be very useful to understand these drivers for being able to predict when we might expect birds to start moving. Um, for the future, obviously, we would like to develop a water bird mobility network that relatively closely matches the human transport network that I showed you in the beginning. Um, for that, it would also be important to potentially look at the environmental persistence of AIV so that maybe infection happens not just when you get in contact with other birds, but also when there are still viable virus particles in the environment. And in the end, and that's going to be the big test, um, seeing whether our models of water bird mobility can actually retroactively or in future predict the arrival and the timing of outbreaks of AIV. And with that, I would like to thank you for having me today. And obviously a big thank you as well to all of our collaborators and Jonas Wallenström, who basically enables me to do this kind of work. Thank you very much. Wow, thank you, Mariella. You've presented a lot of interesting information to us, and I'm particularly impressed that Golden Eagle can catch a duck flying at 180 kilometers an hour. That's quite an achievement. Um, I also would like to invite uh, Thijs back, if you, Thijs, if you can put your camera and microphone back on. Uh, and then I'm particularly interested if the two of you, what, what would you ask each other for the future of highly pathogen AVT influenza? with this super modern, awesome technology that I really hope you're going to put in an app one day and I can just look on my phone and say, oh, they're, they're migrating tomorrow over my house or something. There is actually an app for that. Oh, It's oh, called the Animal Tracker. It's uh, developed by the MoveBank team, which is an animal movement database. So you can oh. follow um, animals follow, flying around. <laughs> I'm going to download it immediately. 
that is what, what what do you make of this fantastic information and and study achievements that Mariella is presenting well i think that's really wonderful to have this uh, um uh discipline and uh, Mariella's uh, work um, involved with uh, avian influenza research because it really uh, adds a lot because wild birds are very important um, in the, the spread of uh, the virus, especially now when the, vir the high path avian influenza virus has become adapted to wild birds. It's, it's very uh, um, uh, relevant uh, just now. Um, Maybe, uh, um, Marielle, can you say something about um, uh, uh, improving uh, early warning um, for the um, arrival of uh, high path avian influenza virus using um, the knowledge that you have from the GPS tagged birds? That's a good question, because early warning is obviously what we would ideally want, um, but I also think it's relatively complex to achieve. Um, I think this is going to really hinge on, I think, the citizen science data, just because it's such a timely source of data, um, and it's also so geographically widespread. So I would say being able to um, motivate more people to report observations would be great. I think that could be particularly helpful. Mm -hmm. I mean, especially we have been doing some work in Bangladesh, for example, and it's a very large country and they have an amazing diversity of birds. It's 200 million people in the country and we met nearly all the bird watchers there are, which are about 40. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, basically enabling more people to become bird watchers and reporting. Okay. Yeah. Um, one thing that we found back in 2005, 2006, is that the zero degrees isotherm seemed to be um, co correlated. So the, the, the actual line across the geographical map where, the, where it's zero degrees was correlated with a higher um, occurrence of high path avian influenza virus outbreaks, detections at least in wild mm -hmm. birds and especially. Um, do you have any information from the GPS tag birds, how this movement of um, uh, the zero degrees isotherm, that is, you know, wh where it freezes and where it doesn't in uh, Europe affects the, the, the movement of birds? Do you, do you see that from your GPS tags? That's uh, something that I'm working on at the moment in terms of models, but I think there have been previous studies as well. I think there is a study from 2009 uh, from the people in Switzerland um, showing basically if you have freezing temperatures, birds start to move more. And in terms of wetland specialists, it makes a lot of sense that as soon as basically the habitat freezes up that they would move elsewhere, either short distances to um, open water bodies, if, if you have, for example, um, running water or so, or over larger distances. Um, if that is not an option. But I think it might probably be a very important trigger and it's something that I'm looking at at the moment. Interesting. We have one question coming in through a chat function for you from uh, Lineke. It says, the world has changed a lot since the start of ring studies slash migration pattern studies, e.g. loss of habitat. Are there any changes observed in migration patterns of certain species of geese or ducks uh, going... Uh, related to this, so going to the drivers of migration? Uh, that is currently definitely the, the case, I would say. So there have been quite a few studies looking at how does the increasing urbanization and anthropogenic um, changing of, uh, of the landscape affect movement. And I think there was a recent study on mammals that shows basically that mammals move differently if you're in a more uh, urban environment. And that is a global pattern. Uh, but it probably also changes migration. So the timing of migration is already changing through climate change. So sp spring migration advances and autumn migration might become later just because conditions stay are, are just different. Um, uh, but I also think that there have been quite some studies and don't nail me down on the details, but there is a likelihood of migration changing, especially in its distance and its extent. Um, depending on climate change. So what I see here, for example, 
Um, geese didn't used to overwinter in Sweden, but now if you have a mild winter and grass stays green for longer, they stay here for longer. And that means that potentially, if it becomes mild enough that there is no snow at all and forage is available at all time, they might tend to stay, thus shortening the migration over time. Yes. It's definitely a possibility. Yes, no, absolutely. Um, thank you for that. Another question from Albert. Do you think that environmental DNA, or in this case, eRNA, can be useful to detect early cases into the field using portable nanopore technology, for example, or even help to identify avian individuals via genomic information as an additional tool to study migration? It's also in the chat function if you want to read it again, mm -hmm. because there's a lot of Yes, so maybe uh, I can answer to that. Um, there is yeah. a, a very good uh, research going on um, in, in uh, um, detection of avian influenza in environmental samples, mud and uh, water. And it's, it's uh, really uh, improving a lot, becoming very sensitive and also allowing um, the, the um, uh, determination which avian species are present in that location. So I think it's a, a, a really important uh, complementary method to um, surveillance of avian influenza in, in wild birds. Yeah, yeah, makes sense. Um, then a the question, do you see, and I was also really curious about this because I understood that highly pathogenic avian influenza kills birds pretty quickly. So I'm surprised that it can travel such great distances. So the question from Yinge is, do you see any influence on highly pathogenic avian influenza on the distance of migration? Oh, that is a very tricky question, because usually um, I, I, I have uh, limited knowledge of that because I don't ever encountered it myself in the field. Um, but we did have I did have a master student, for example, who captured some ducks, some mallets at the trap and sampled them. And she didn't see any difference in behavior, but they were infected with highly pathogenic avian influenza and they were seemingly entirely fine. There have been suggestions that infection with influenza does affect the, the propensity to move and might affect movement distance. The problem is that uh, as long as you have a relatively low prevalence in the population, the chance of actually catching this individual early on during the infection, putting a tag on it, and then seeing at how it behaves as opposed to later, is relatively hard to achieve. So you have to be mm -hmm. really lucky to look at that and get the, the, the sample sizes that would allow you to draw any kind of conclusions from that. Um, uh, yeah, and it's, I guess... It's difficult. <laughs> yeah, and I guess you also don't know what, what the extent of, of infection and damage is to the individual, right? Mm -hmm. at that stage because you, the bird's still alive and you set it free again. Yes, and then the question is also, and this is maybe for Thais, what is the incubation time? Um, so the, the virus can become, after inoculation, the virus can be, start to be excreted or, already uh, within one day. So the mm -hmm. incubation time is very short. Um, so separate from uh, your um, studies on, on, on uh, movements of birds, we do know that in um, individual wild birds of the same species, you have both animals that become clinically ill and die, and also animals that um, show no clinical signs and are um, uh, found infected with the virus um, because they have been shot by a hunter, mm -hmm. and then they were apparently healthy before they were shot. Uh, or because they are caught um, in a, a duck trap. So clearly um, there's a, a, a large variation in the degree of clinical signs, um, but to which whether um, even a bird that is subclinically infected with a high path avian influenza virus um, uh, has a shorter migration distance than one that would not, was not infected, we, we don't know that. We don't mm -hmm. know the answer to that question. For low path avian influenza virus, I think overall it, it looks like it has virtually or no clinical effect. Very good. Well, thank you for that. So we're running over time. So I would like to thank you both, Thijs and Marielle, for your very interesting information uh, you shared with us today. I hope um, 
you know, we get it a little bit under control and there won't be too many mutations coming up in anytime soon. Um, and with that, uh, thank you both. And I would like to ask us, uh, everybody who's viewing today to please subscribe to our newsletter and our YouTube channel to stay up to date of NCOH events, such as webinars, our annual meeting and our science cafe. And I would like you all to thank you for dialing in and we hope to see you all soon again. Thank you, Thais. Thank you, Mariella, uh, Mike, thank and Asma for organizing. And thank you all for dialing in. Goodbye. Bye.